Welcome to the Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of The Heal Podcast, I sit down with my dear friend, Dr. Mike Dow. Dr. Dow holds many titles, psychotherapist, New York Times bestselling author, brain and mental health expert, functional nutritionist, hypnotherapist, and even my most passionate and enthusiastic doctor friend. In addition to hosting his own shows, he is a frequent guest on NBC's Today Show, The Dr. Oz Show, the doctors, and many more. Today, we dive into the world of psychedelics and specifically ketamine-assisted therapy. I was excited to have this conversation because truth be told, I have some pretty strong preconceived notions about ketamine. And I wanted to see if in this world of high anxiety, depression, and stress, if this was just another trendy avenue for people to escape and get high or if ketamine truly offered new access to healing trauma and mental illness. Mike's passion for this treatment is palpable. So let's get to it, and I'll let you be the judge. All right, so Dr. Mike Dow, thank you so much for coming on the HEAL podcast, and it's so great to be able to interview you and again. see you again. And yes, see thank you, you and me. hang, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So um, I love a good personal story. Yeah. Um, you know, which inspires and compels people to do the powerful work they're doing on the planet today. And yep. and I know you have a pretty profound one. So do you mind sharing with those who haven't heard it, what happened in your personal life that drove you to, to find this work in hypnotherapy? I would love to. So in terms of hypnosis, I actually really needed some continued education for my license. <laughs> and I trained in everything else. <laughs> So in terms of hypnosis, I went to this uh, workshop and I wasn't expecting much. And then the first day of our training, we had to be paired off and practice some of the skills that we were learning in this introductory, you know, th four day training or something. And I went so deep into this hypnotic trance that felt so much deeper, but also easier than thousands of hours of meditation. And I, in that instant, knew that this was a healing modality that I would be able to use um, to, to really profoundly heal brains, especially these disorders like PTSD, where we really need to target the, the emotional centers of the brain, the amygdala, the limbic system. Flash forward to years later, uh, and my partner and I, so my partner's an ER doctor, and we, I'd been reading all this literature um, in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and the other psychedelic-assisted psychotherapies. And some of the literature and the data was just too potent and too powerful and too shocking to ignore. So we went to a, a training, uh, the training for ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, and it was also very experiential. So I'm sitting in a room um, and... Coincidentally, both trainings were in Austin, Texas. Oh, <laughs> Just, interesting. Uh, the yeah, hub of hypnosis. <laughs> total, but totally different um, organization. So once again, I'm back in Austin, Texas. I live in Los Angeles. And we're in a room, so 30 MDs and PhDs, and we're doing the experiential part where we take turns using the medicine and being each other's therapist in this, again, this paired off dyad, right? And the things that I was feeling personally, but then also the things and the experiences, experiences that I was witnessing in the room were just so mind boggling, Kelly. I, I remember this, this one MD said when we were processing this experience, um, saying, I think, and she's probably, I don't know, in her fifties, I think I just forgave my adopted, uh, my, my bio mother for giving me up for adoption in that, in the, that last two hours. And, and it was like, wow. There, there was this uh, other provider who said, um, I think I just made peace with you know, my husband who passed three years ago. I think I just made peace with it. And I think <laughs> the last two hours was more impactful than the two years of weekly psychotherapy. So it's, it's not that psychotherapy or hypnosis is irrelevant. Uh, but it's really the the blending of these models. And now I do ketamine assisted hypnosis and some other advanced modalities. And I'm just having these just incredible results. So so that's that's my 
Intuit story. <laughs> Got it. So you are doing ketamine assisted hypnotherapy, which I have, you know, when you first talked about it to me, I had this kind of like visceral reaction of, you know, where I had to like not roll my eyes because mm -hmm. my, you know, I first was introduced to unknowing ketamine when I was like 22 and it was like a special K. It was like a yeah. drug that people used recreationally in the club scene in LA and it never appealed to me because it was like a horse tranquilizer. Yeah. That does not sound like a fun time to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so it's been around. I'm in my 40s now. So I've known about it for 20 years. And now for um, people to use this anesthesia, essentially, is yeah. what it is to access greater le levels of healing. Yeah. And then recently someone in my life who is this, you know, pretty archetype of a, you know, perpetual addict that mm -hmm. causes drama and pain in, in my personal life um, has, was addicted to ketamine and, and, you know, I guess it doesn't show up on drug tests. So it's this like new drug of choice. And, mm -hmm. um, and I understand how the detrimental effect that anesthesia takes on a body, you mm -hmm. know, when you go into surgery, mm -hmm. it takes your, you know, if you go under general anesthesia, it takes your body six months or so to clear it out of your body. I don't yeah. know what the actual time is, but um, so to use this special K anesthesia for therapy, mm -hmm. you know, while recreational drug users are addicting it and, and getting these psychiatrists to prescribe ketamine assisted therapy. Yeah. I was just like, oh God, okay, this is next the next hot trendy thing. So just talk to us more about what the benefits of the actual drug are yeah. and you know the the experiences that you s describe sound profound yeah. but are they lasting they, they can be so oh you, you just raised so many great questions i have to tackle every single one <laughs> Sorry, of them that was like nine and, and your visceral reaction kelly it's so valid it is so valid because there are people who do abuse ketamine and other drugs and I think one of the things that we're seeing, um, so I'm now a field trip health therapist. So field trip, we're the largest provider of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in the world. We have clinics in Canada, the US, Europe, and we're offering, so at our Amsterdam clinic, there's psilocybin and ketamine assisted psychotherapy. Right now in the US, we're only offering ketamine assisted psychotherapy, but that's probably gonna change in the next, I would guess two years. We're probably gonna have MDMA, psilocybin in the next, you know, maybe two, maybe four, we'll see how the laws change. But what's really different is we say no to a lot of people. And there's this big difference out there that I really want people to understand. There are clinics that do ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And then there are the, I'm gonna go to this place and I'm gonna fill out a questionnaire that's 20 questions. And within 20 minutes, somebody's hook, hooking me up to an IV and I'm getting ketamine and there's no therapy. I was actually, um, there's a, a place that has cryotherapy mm -hmm. and a, a staff of nurses, but it's mostly like a Botox factory for people. And they started offering ketamine infusions there with nobody with any sort of training, right? Yikes. So I, I think that there is a huge danger when you can just sort of use this drug as much as you like. What we want to do, uh, and certainly what we do at Field Trip, you know, you have a really thorough screening. And by the way, that's for people's safety. What people don't understand, you want to make sure that you don't have one of the conditions where ketamine is going to make you worse. Right. So that does happen. And I think people just think, oh, ketamine, I'm pro. That's great. Right. But it's not always pro psilocybin, too. You know, if you have this family history of of psychosis or bipolar disorder, we don't want to activate and turn on disorders that are maybe just beneath the surface. So it's really for for your benefit. Mm -hmm. But if you go to some of these other places where it's just sort of up, oh, come in, pay 500 bucks a pop as much as you want. I think that there is a danger in that. And also, more importantly, it's a missed opportunity. So the the tolerance of ketamine develops pretty rapidly, even between your first, second, and third session. Mm. And every time it's a little bit less profound, but you have this, um, and hypnosis can help you to get there. It's sort of like, you know, imagine the places that you've been to in, in your hypnosis and meditation, mm -hmm. and then multiply it times probably 50. That's where ketamine takes you. Wow. So you have this, it's sort of like opening Pandora's box and you get this really rare, profound, sometimes life-changing glimpse into your subconscious and what some people view as the collective unconscious. And when you have at these 
mid to high doses ego death. And for an hour, the part of you that knows you're Kelly, that knows you live in Los Angeles, that knows that you're a mom, if that part of you disappears and you just feel at one with all living beings mm -hmm. and the universe, it is hard to come back from that unchanged, but you also have to talk about it. So what we do is it's really all about the integration between that experience mm. and psychotherapy. So, you know, in, in our program, you know, a lot of the literature, we see that six doses, what we call our medicine sessions of ketamine assisted psychotherapy, where a, a trained therapist, a psychedelic assisted trained therapist is sitting with you the entire time, mm -hmm. right? Not sort of a nurse hooking up to an IV and then leaving you alone in a room that feels like a hospital. So our, our clinic in Santa Monica, it feels like a spa. You take off your shoes. Um, you're in one of our medicine treatment rooms that has a zero gravity chair. We can lie on the floor. If people would prefer to lie on the floor. We have weighted blankets. There's this art that kind of just feels very peaceful, sort of like this room. Um, and it sort of puts you in this state. And then after the two hours, what we do that's also very different is we have these integration rooms. So people do art therapy, they draw. And then after your first session, we have another session without medicine to talk about the experience. So it's really, to me, the true magic um, is we want to use the, the, the life-changing glimpse that ketamine can give us into the subconscious while it's, by the way, the fastest antidepressant known on the face of the planet, but it's short acting when you don't combine it with psychotherapy, right? Mm -hmm. So we know, this is amazing. If somebody is um, in, in research, when you have groups of people who are severely depressed and suicidal, more than half of them will no longer be suicidal within 24 hours after receiving one dose of ketamine. Mm -hmm. But it's short acting, mm -hmm. right? The, and even at the clinics, when you go for that six dose session, it's also short acting. But what we're finding in our research at Field Trip, we have a white paper where we followed some of the people who've been through our program. And so if you come in for our program, it's a total of about 10 sessions, six with medicine, four without. So mm -hmm. we have these integration sessions, we have a preparation session. And what we're finding is that the effects are lasting. Mm. So it's really the combination of all these different things. You know, for me, I, I, I weave a little hypnosis in there. It's hypnosis. It's uh, meditation. It's this, this medicine. And that is why, I, I, you know, we don't have the, the drug seekers and the people who really we need to be worried about in terms of that behavior. And, uh, you know, because, again, I, I'm thinking of Special K as a horse tranquilizer yeah. and a and a, um, anesthesia, mm -hmm. you know, is, it, is this micro dosing? Are these non dangerous levels of anesthesia? Does it get move out of your system? Like what's that? Yes. Whole uh, great question. Balance? So we are using a much lower dose. So when anesthesiologists or ER doctors are using ketamine as a dissociative anesthesia, they're using doses that are, you know, 10 times higher approximately. Um, and we are, are, are very conservative at field trip and, Frankly, if you've never had a ketamine assisted psychotherapy session, you know, you and I, if you want, if we have three minutes, we can do a little practice and I can do a little hypnosis that I think mirrors it to some degree, but there's nothing that can really, you know, they say it's noetic. They say there are no words to describe the experience unless you've had it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting uh, that, you know, we see in the, in the special K users and, and by the way, <laughs> After having this experience, I have no idea why anybody would want to use this drug on a dance floor at a rave. It just sounds, frankly, to me, terrifying. And if you've ever seen anybody in a K-hole, why would you want to give yourself that experience on a dance floor? I mean, it's, it's dangerous. It's, yeah. it's frightening. But what we do see is that in, um, used in, as anesthesia or used... Um, it, in party drug settings, it is a larger dose. So for example, ketamine can result in long-term damage of the bladder. We see that in recreational users who are using it, they're using large doses very, very frequently. Conversely, at Field Trip, what we wanna do, we wanna find the smallest therapeutic dose for the longest amount of time, not increasing amount of doses because there, ketamine is a, there's a real sweet spot of ketamine. And a little bit of this drug can make your brain a lot better. Mm -hmm. Large doses can make it worse. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, you know, I, I think there's this paradigm shift where it used to be, oh, well, let's just turn up or down the neurotransmitters with medications. Or, uh, you know, that's a very, you know, traditional old school model of psychiatry where it's the, okay, 
Wellbutrin's for upping dopamine and the SSRIs are for upping serotonin. But I think there's something that we're ignoring and the neuroplasticity model, I think to me, um, and looking and trying to explain why does this work? Mm -hmm. There's actually some overlap now we think of ECT and ketamine in terms of the neuroplasticity. In animal models, you know, parts of our brains, when we go through really stressful things in our lives, we can actually cause our neurons and parts of the neurons to die and wither away. In animal studies, small doses of ketamine, the neurons instantly spring back to life. Parts of the neurons that have been died, you know, when we mimic uh, adverse childhood experiences and in animal models and we put them through something stressful and we look at the neurons, ketamine in small doses, again, it's it's rebuilding. It's, and there's a boost in neuroplasticity. So could it be said that it's not just this dissociative um, sort of subconscious amplifying medicine, but is it actually remodeling our brain? And is that why we're finding that for people, and I think especially people who've tried everything else, they've been in talk therapy, they've tried supplements, they've tried medication, they tried everything under the sun. Is that why we're having so much success? It, it, to me, it's, it's just mind boggling. Wow. Yeah. What have you seen for people that are listening going, oh, this is intriguing, but is it right for me? What kind of conditions are you most commonly treating successfully with this? Yeah, great question. So the number one thing that we are treating is treatment-resistant depression. So in fact, at our clinic in Canada, uh, right now we have just Toronto, but we're opening up uh, a bunch of others. Um, the Canadian government will only let us treat treatment-resistant depression. So that means if a patient comes um, and is screened by our psychiatrist there, uh, they have to have failed two or more medications and uh, a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Uh, In the United States, we have more flexibility. So um, we have sessions that are that include two medicine sessions and then six so the six medicine session model that includes about 10 total sessions of talk therapy these integration sessions and the six medicine sessions that's really great for treatment resistant depression Um, that is sometimes comorbid with anxiety but sometimes you know when we talked about that ego death where kelly doesn't know that she's kelly for an hour Mm -hmm. and you know i can tell you that my partner um, as an ER doctor, he's definitely the the typical quote left brainer of us, and I'm the quote right brainer, right? I'm the emotional one. He's the 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 more rational one, and he has never had a spiritual experience in his life until we went to our ketamine training. It sounds so, like this turns off the left brain hemisphere. Yes. Yeah. I interviewed Dr. Jill Voldy Taylor and, you know, her four characters yes. of her brain. And yeah. so it sounds like this is allowing, you know, characters three and four of the right brain emotional and thinking centers yeah. to to dominate and get that connection, oneness feeling. There's a line in her book that she talks about all these people asking her, is psychedelics the way to, to do that? She says, that's not my field of expertise, but I can tell you reading her story of her stroke I believe that psychedelics are the way to get there. So yes, you know, all of that, the rational, the monkey mind, that part of you that is just always thinking and planning, it shuts it off. And, you know, my partner, he had his first spiritual experience of his entire life Mm. after decades of living, not a single one. And he always um, would say to uh, my friend who, who, you know, Dr. Felicia, you know, oh, you guys are so spiritual. I, I'm kind of envious of that. I want that. And Eureka, he had it in ketamine. And I was watching him because I was um, I was a, what we call a sitter or the therapist that day. And he was having the experience with somebody else, um, with our friend as the sitter. And he was kind of doing this, like, it, it kind of looked like he was dancing to Britney Spears, but, you know? <laughs> and later he says that he could feel, you know, and of course, you know, being an ER physician working all overnight, 12 hour shifts is really taxing. Mm. He said he could feel his light coming back on from, wow. from within. So it's not, it's not like a talking thing. It's a feeling thing. Mm. Um, and I can tell you that that experience changed him and it changed us in many ways forever. And we don't need to go back to that. He, that's, that's like an aha moment. And for me, my ego death that I experienced, that was an aha moment that I don't need to repeat. There are other effects, you know, so if somebody does have really treatment resistant depression, sometimes we do need to do, you know, a, a booster dose. But going back to some of the other conditions, you know, I love it for, I think it personally, for PTSD, 
there is nothing more potent. It takes you right there. And then if you're with somebody like me who knows how to weave hypnosis and some of the bilateral stimulation therapies and the imaging, when somebody is in that state, because it is a trance, it is a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And I can tell you all of the, there in our training in, in Austin, there was this pair, an MD and a PhD, both vets. And sure enough, ketamine activated their trauma directly. I mean, I, one of the guys, it sounded like he was in Afghanistan going through the experience. So you have to have somebody sitting with you. Can you imagine being at a clinic where it's just, there's a nurse there and it's like, what do I do with this? Yeah. But when you're with somebody like me, I know exactly what to do with that. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, again, it's the activation of uh, our subconscious where all these memories are stored. And it's, it's, a, it's a rare glimpse. So if you bring it up, clear it so you can process it, right? Um, instead of it getting stuck and uh, continuously activating those emo emotional circuitry um, that, that causes the hypervigilance that we see in PTSD. So what if we could actually clear it? That to me is really exciting. Um, also anxiety, um, you know, it is an off-label medication. So, you know, if somebody has depression with OCD or, you know, most people with depression also have comorbid anxiety. Um, there's some research, you know, we're very, um, we're very conservative at Field Trip, but you know, there's new research um, looking at, you know, you asked how, how long does it last? Um, uh, there's a psychiatrist who does a lot of ketamine research and he published a paper on looking at how, just how quickly it leaves the body that theoretically that um, I think soon it will be okay for, for nursing women as long as they have a session eight up, you know, a, a certain number of hours away, but it's, it's cleared very rapidly by your body, which is, it's, very powerful and, and good for us too. Um, so I think it's just a really, really exciting time. And for many people, the lights come back on after this therapy, especially if they've tried so many other things. Wow, especially in this time of history where anxiety and depression and suicide rates are through the roof. Yeah. And so what is happening? Talk to me a little bit about how hypnotherapy works um, neurologically because, you know, we talk about in HEAL understanding that we're, you know, we're kind of in this hypnotic state our whole life. We're being yeah. run by our subconscious programming 95% of our day. Yeah. And 75% of our subconscious belief systems are negative and disempowering. You layer trauma on in there and we suppress or repress emotions because it's just so painful and we don't have the tools to process that emotion. 100%. Um, so that stuff gets stuck in this loop in our head. So how does hypnotherapy access that? And then how does ketamine and hypnotherapy combine to be that, you know, or to offer that opportunity for a permanent healing in the brain? Yeah. So I think one of the most fascinating things that I talk about in my hypnosis book, Your Subconscious Brain Can Change Your Life, is really looking at how dissociation is a positive, on-purpose uh, experience that we use in hypnotherapy. But going back to a 12-year-old experiencing trauma, isn't it interesting that the brain actually already knows how to dissociate when it's going through something that it cannot handle? So in many ways, I, I think the trance that people go into and leaving the body that you can actually mimic with hypnosis, we are actually going back to a skill that people already have, right? So if you are somebody who learned to dissociate it's your brain naturally did that. Your brain said, you're not ready to handle this. This is too much. Let's, I'm going to help you to go away from your body while this is happening to you. You're not going to have some really explicit memories of this. Um, and we're going to put it away somewhere. And hopefully someday it's going to be locked up in that cabinet over there in the fifth basement underneath the stairs. And hopefully someday somebody's going to be able to access that. But in the meantime, every time you have an event that feels similar, you're probably going to have some re-experiencing. You're going to be hypervigilant. Your, your smoke detector is going to be turned up too high and you're going to be anxious at anything in life until somebody can figure out how to actually do that. In many ways, that's what hypnosis does, right? It's the taking the thing that you learned how to do to go into this trance and leave your body that, you know, if you've ever experienced highway hypnosis where it's like you're you're driving and it takes you an hour to get home and you pull in your driveway and you're like, 
God, I don't remember, how did I get home? I wasn't actually there, mm -hmm. you know? So in many ways, we're always in this trance and our subconscious does take over because if, if you were going through your life and you had to actually sort out everything, you know, this is Buddha, this is wood, what is wood? You know, I, if I didn't know what Buddha was or what wood was, and that was my first time, you know, the subconscious has to take over a lot of processes because it would be so time consuming that we wouldn't get anything done. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it, that also robs us of the joy of the present moment and experiencing something. So it, I, I think it's just so fascinating to conceptualize hypnosis as two sides of a coin. So now that person who's locked the traumatic memory in that filing cabinet underneath the basement, you know, can we use this and can we rewire the brain and, you know, it, the, the most fun I had writing that hypnosis book was having my buddy, Dr. Amen, scan my brain while in trance. So you can actually see, we did a baseline and then we did trance. And we did a SPECT, which shows blood flow over time. And then we did a, a, an EEG, which shows brain waves and the electrical activity. And it was so interesting. You could see the connections changing in the brain. You can see that some brain structures are activated and others go dormant. So, you know, I think most notably, and then sort of the, the brain waves, and we look at uh, brain waves measured on an EEG, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta, from fastest to slowest. Um, you know, what we saw in my brain is that the most of the brain got bathed in theta brain waves, which is, of course, the brain wave that we are in while we are dreaming. Coincidentally, people who don't have enough REM sleep and get enough theta brainwave activity, they are more likely to develop PTSD. So isn't it interesting that the theta brainwave dominant thing that again, your brain does naturally when you sleep, if you're somebody who doesn't get that, that maybe that is the brain's way of processing the trauma from that day. And you're in Afghanistan and you just lost somebody, but you didn't dream. So your brain didn't have the theta brainwave activity to sort of play something out in dreams to emotionally discharge it from the amygdala mm. and the limbic system. So now it's stuck there. Wow. So hypnosis is going back in, in a awake state, although I, I personally think that hypnosis is somewhere in between being awake and being asleep, but you're sort of teetering on that edge. So you're going back there on purpose and you're being very specific. So in our dreams, our, I, think, I think our brains know how to take care of us. Our subconscious is always looking out for us. So I think in dreams, the subconscious does it naturally, but if you don't have it or if it's incomplete or you're somebody who genetically has lower levels of oxytocin, because we also see that if you give somebody intranasal oxytocin after a stressful event, they're far less likely to develop PTSD. Mm. Um, so in many ways, you're changing the way the brain works in order to access the things that are usually off limits to the conscious brain. Right. And if you're, if you have this, it sounds like if you have this chronic stress um, because of your environment, being in war or childhood, you know, abusive environment, then you're in this like chronic, chronic stress state, which is going to diminish your sleep quality yep. uh, and your ability to do the natural healing process of the brain, which would be to get into this dream theta state yeah. to defrag the system on its own. Yeah. So things exactly. get in the way. So then you need hypnotherapy and other things to induce that theta state and then what do you do? You you use language to reassign meaning to the event, or how does yeah? How does so it work? yeah, all everything you said is exactly right. Yes. So in hypnosis, we use new languaging, and I would say it's almost more because you know hypnosis really does talk to the right side of the brain, and we've actually seen that in research that you know sort of uh, the activity goes up on, in in this hemisphere, and um, we are using it. Kind of feels a lot more like guided imagery. And what's so interesting about PTSD, the symptoms are not um, words. The symptoms are mostly feelings. The, f the symptoms are sensory based, mm -hmm. right? So that's why somebody can be fine and they smell something and it takes you right back to that memory. Like, oh, my, my, my grand, I, I, there are certain smells that will take me right back to a, a certain memory. But imagine if that's associated with trauma. So a smell just, you know, you have this flooding of adrenaline and norepinephrine and, and you, you get in that fight or flight mode. But imagine if you could actually use this guided imagery language to sort of delete. Um, so that's what I do in my protocol. Um, I, I really um, walk people through a lot of these 
um, scenarios where it's like we're controlling the projector and you're in a movie theater. So how can we actually turn down the volume? How can we now process it? How can we sometimes I'll have people, especially when I sense somebody is not giving them some some credit, I will have them zoom in on all the things that they did in the traumatic memory to take care of themselves, right? So if you wore a second pair of clothes every night and you knew you were being sexually abused, zooming in on that, like, isn't it wonderful that you already at seven years old knew how to try to take care of yourself, right? That inner healing intelligence that said, I need to go somewhere else in my brain, looking at that as, as a piece of that as well. Um, it, it's, it's really profound when you can actually help somebody to sort of visualize things and it just sort of creates this reframe. So interestingly, you know, we're talking about those, those brain waves. Ketamine, the dominant brain wave is, ketamine takes brains into a theta, but also delta. So if I'm ranking things, so alpha is, is a nice relaxed um, meditation. Theta takes you even lower. And this is exactly how it felt to me the first time I was uh, using hypnosis at my training. It, it feels deeper than meditation. That's exactly how it feels to mm -hmm. me. And then ketamine is sort of like low theta, bordering sometimes on delta, so it's even deeper. So that part of you that really knows that you're the dreamer sometimes goes offline. So then, but you're still experiencing something. So what is that? Is that pure consciousness? Uh, if you see God, if you see source, if you see universe, if you see all living beings, you know, I lost, I lost my grandfather this year to COVID and I, in my ketamine, um, one of my experiences, I had one this year, um, I felt like I was in the universe and there were all these lights. And I soon had this sense that the lights were all these beings who had passed onto the other world. And I could feel that one of the lights was my grandfather. And then when I was out of that experience, um, uh, one of the doctors who's, you know, he's one of our MDs, he, he asked me, is your, and is he okay? And I said, yeah. I think he's okay. So how, how does, okay, so you see how me losing my grandfather and having this feeling where I didn't even know I was me, but I, I knew somehow that one of the lights was him and he was okay, right? So that would be how, for example, somebody experiencing grief would process it in ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And that is very different than traditional talk therapies. But I also have to say for people, I, I think they go really nicely together. So it's not that, oh, you come to us for 10 sessions at field trip and then you're done and you're going to stop seeing your therapist weekly. I think it just enriches everything. You just got, you, you just went so much deeper. So the stuff your therapist has been trying to get you to, to access for two years, but sometimes you just don't have the tools uh, because sometimes it's just so locked away in your subconscious. Now you can really talk about it for a year and now just watch, you know, sometimes I hear people, they leave our program and the work that they do just after is so much richer, so much more meaningful, so much more effective mm -hmm. because everything's unlocked. Yeah, it's like they got a deeper access because the ketamine made them more open or... Yeah. Um, what about, you know, like for me, I'm like, well, I don't really have anything traumatic I'm dealing with right now that ketamine-assisted therapy, you know, it, obviously the connection and the oneness sounds like me doing mushrooms on the beach in high school or <laughs> right, I right. like discovered the meaning of life and yeah. it was amazing. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not recommending that that's <laughs> used in high school, Disclaimer, but <laughs> <asterisk>. <laughs> it was the nineties, you know? Um, but you know, the psychedelics, that was my experience. And, and I had a similar experience of oneness connection, just yeah. deeper meaning to life. And I understood it, but then it was fleeting. I had no integration after Yeah. I had no understanding, but it was like, I can think back and go, whoa, that was powerful. And yes, I understood everything yeah. in that moment. Now yeah. it's freaking gone. Yeah. But so, but I'd be interested in if, like if there's anything that I've repressed that's mm -hmm. not in my consciousness that mm -hmm. I need to heal that's holding me back, I imagine you can access it in ketamine because it's giving you that deeper layer of access. Like Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we do repress things, right? I don't have a ton of memory of, course. of my childhood. Of course. You know, in our training, you know, again, this room of 30 MDs and PhDs, you know, in our training, it was you have to have the experience to really be able to, to do this work with other people. Um, and there were so many, you know, in our group process, there were so many things that were popping up. Like, uh, I never knew that this was a thing for me. So yes, yes. Number one, even sometimes when you don't know there's something there, there's something there. 
you know, we don't really support recreational ketamine, but we also, if somebody has a feeling and they're stuck in their life, if there's something trapped in your subconscious, there will be a feeling of stuckness, right? So maybe, mm-hmm. you know, DSM-5, or coding that as, uh, let's say that's an adjustment disorder or, you know, anxiety disorder, not otherwise specified, or, you know, looking at, you know, what does that mean for diagnosis? But I think, yes. And then the other thing I wanted to say, imagine if you would have had integration and somebody who knew what that did on the brain and how psilocybin attaches to serotonin receptors and what we know and about increased connectivity. Imagine if you could have sat with somebody for an hour after having that experience. It really is the through line. And it really takes, um, I think most people are not going to harm themselves, you know, doing psilocybin, but you're also, but by the way, some people are going to harm themselves. Yeah. And if and, you're in the wrong state of mind or, or kind of a stressful time in your life, you could have what they call a bad trip. Yeah. And it feels like it's never going to end. And this ex- beautiful oneness experience is hijacked and you're just seeing dark shit, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so it really does need to be in a space of safety and, and support and love. And, and really uh, a thorough screening by somebody who is a really good clinician who knows how to screen, again, to keep you safe. I, I would ballpark it at, I think, 70 to 80% of the population is probably a, a good safe fit, but I think a good 10 to 20% should not, right? So don't you want to know? Because trust me, I've heard 99% of the stories are people who've been through our program and you know it changed their life. But trust me, I've heard plenty of, of real people's stories directly how recreational psilocybin actually ruin their life for a year or more Mm -hmm. so you don't you just want somebody with eyes on you and yes also the safe container it changes the experience because what do you know about psychedelics it's set and setting so your mindset and the setting that you're in so when you're in an environment that kind of feels like this room and there are lots of pinks and at our clinics no matter which clinic you're at i was just at our new new york clinic last week you know there's lots of nature we have greenery on the wall we have all of these uh, we have lots of pinks and greens so it, it just feels so different because nobody has at least i don't know anybody who has positive associations with hospitals or doctor's offices right mm-hmm. so if you go to a ketamine clinic and it feels like a doctor's office and there's by the way a needle in your arm the entire time a lot of people are not going to have a good experience because the setting is reminding you of all those times that you had to go to a hospital Mm -hmm. and it's probably not pleasant. You really want it to feel different. So, you know, our rooms have been reimagined from the ground up. You also, you know, it, I, I think it's fine. You know, I think some groups are doing it as part of a standard practice, but I, for one knew that I wanted a separate space. So I actually approached field trip to say, I want to work with you guys. (laughs) You know, I I heard what they're doing at a colleague who was working there. So I keep my office in LA and that's my private practice. But if I have somebody, you know, so I'm treating somebody tomorrow who I've seen in private practice, but I'm bringing them over to field trip for that experience because it's really hard when people are coming and going for, you know, whether it's medication management or talk therapy. Imagine you're setting up an office in Beverly Hills and somebody is leaving in this, you know, they're, out of, you know, it's two hours since their ketamine dose, but they're still integrating and they're sort of in this very altered state. And then you're in a waiting room and somebody's just there and they're sort of looking yeah. at you. And it's just, so <laughs> they it's haven't just, gone yeah, into that. It, it's nice to have mode, a totally yeah. different setup. And, you know, some of the things that we know in terms of the, the sites that are being approved for uh, trials, you know, for example, MDMA assisted psychotherapy, they really, the government and the, and the, the government boards who are setting this up they really would prefer the bathrooms to be attached right so you don't want to be imagine if there's like a pediatrician and an orthodontist and there's a shared bathroom in the hallway they would really prefer that when people are in this altered state um and yes i have had to walk somebody to the bathroom um in this space and it does happen um usually not in the first hour but it does last sometimes a couple hours and sometimes you have to literally sort of pseudo carry them i mean they can they can pretty much walk but imagine if you were at a Beverly Hills office with the orthodontist <laughs> and a pediatrician, there's a bunch of kids and you know, I, I, you're my patient and I'm, you know, you're like leaning on me and you maybe look a little, you know, <laughs> what are the parents it. thinking like, Oh, is that lady drunk? Like in this medical building, you know? So just having a, a safe space, I think is really profound. Yes. I mean, 
you know, I talked about my psychedelic use already recreational, but um, for the research of HEAL and just for my own self-growth and awareness, I <clears throat> ayahuasca came into my awareness like three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I talked to my friend that kind of was talking to me about it for a year and she's just like, look, you, you're not ready until you know you're ready because mm-hmm. it's intense. Mm-hmm. And so I get the sense of urgency sometimes and I was researching and for what I was doing at the time and I'm like, um, I just, I'm ready to do it. So this, this shaman was coming to LA and I, and I went to this, it, it was the shaman that this woman had worked with like a hundred times mm-hmm. and she had, she was like apprenticing. So I felt comfortable just, you know, via her and went to this like bo- bottom. I didn't know anybody there. I took a friend with me. Um, and it was like this bottom apartment, bottom level apartment in Century City mm-hmm. with the shaman, with people I didn't know energy I didn't know and zero framework for what the journey was going to Sounds look like. Frightening. It was freaking <laughs> yeah, awful. Yeah, it was yeah. literally hell. Dark. Dark and just I felt unsupported, just total chaos. Yeah. And um that's that the word would be chaos in my head. And um you know, me coming home <laughs> going, I will, that is not my medicine. I will never do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Cut to, oh, that was like five years ago. So I was still doing heal. Yeah. Um, then two years ago, um, or three years ago, I was invited down to Costa Rica to speak about heal mm-hmm. at this, at this, um, plant medicine retreat center. Mm-hmm. And I assumed that they would have breath work all week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then ayahuasca, so he had a choice. I mm-hmm. picked a week that was specifically breath work and ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. So I thought I had a choice. Once we got down there, um, you know, there, there, it was only ayahuasca. It was breath work at the beginning and breath work at the end. So yeah. there was nothing else to do but four days of ayahuasca. I was like, yeah. oh God, <laughs> I am not, I, I don't want to do it. Well, long story short, I had a friend that accompanied me down there that swore she would never talk to Mrs. Moon, which mm-hmm. is what... <laughs> The guy who founded this retreat center mm-hmm. called her, um, and she, because of, she had this profound experience in breath work, she was open to doing ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. I was like, "What? Mm-hmm. Who are you? And what have you done to my friend?" But it was mm-hmm. just cracking open. Mm-hmm. So we went to this informational um, informational meeting, and they gave us this roadmap of what the journey would look like. The three questions you ask Mother Ayahuasca. It was in it was in Costa Rica. Very different energy. It was around a bunch of people, but everybody in kind of a community space, um, outdoors. And I had this roadmap and this framework and this pathway. Mm -hmm. So I felt prepared going into this. So because my friend wanted to do it, I felt like I had to protect her. And so I I just like, I did it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And they were going to do it for four days. um, And he said, look, sometimes it gets one ceremony, you can get through all three questions. Maybe it takes four days to get through one question. You mm-hmm. just don't know. Mm-hmm. But at least I had the map and at least I had the understanding of what was going to go down, yeah. you know, in juxtaposition of the first time. All of that to say, that experience was so profound. I actually understood really? why the first, yeah. it tied back to that set first and experience. Yeah. And it was set and setting and, and it was, you know, profound and changed me forever, you know? Yeah. Um, so that anybody who's listening that's, you know, thinking about psychedelics or plant medicine in any way, you know, set and setting is everything. That's it. The safety, right? Your subconscious knows when you're safe and when you're not safe. And you can set this up in a really beautiful way that can help people to feel safe. And, you know, the other thing that I will say is ketamine versus ayahuasca. One of the things I love about ketamine is that you can really titrate the dose. I mean, yes, people microdose LSD and they microdose microdose psilocybin but you're not really having an experience ketamine if you're if you're somebody who is very very nervous if we give you a very very low dose it it doesn't it the it it still works right it i I feel like yes we have these heroic doses in psilocybin and a and a a macro dose but you're usually tripping or not tripping right and once you cross the i'm tripping bridge when it comes to lsd or psilocybin that's an all-day journey that's six hours seven eight hours right so ketamine, number one, it's short acting. So if for some reason, and I haven't had this experience, but somebody just hates it, it's over quickly. Um, but people usually love it. But the other thing, um, and what we usually do, I would say not always, but usually we start low in the first medicine session. And once you understand it, then some people want to go up and some people know exactly, I want to stay right there. So usually what happens, so 
um, you know, I'll be sitting with somebody. Uh, we do we do use a blood pressure cuff because some people uh, it can elevate blood pressure a bit, but it's you know generally very very safe. Um, and then you know, 15 minutes. And at, at field trip in Santa Monica, we use intramuscular, so it's just a quick little painless shot. Um, pretty painless, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, and then 15 minutes later, um, uh, our, our doc um, or our nurse practitioner will come in and say another no. And then the patient is usually enough. Uh, will usually right away know exactly yes or no, okay, deeper or not. But you can really you can have a full experience with a low dose, especially with everything we have, the music, the playlist, my words, um, the weighted blanket. So if you're somebody who's like, I'm dipping my toe in the water, <laughs> right? There are different levels of experience. And we see that in literature with ketamine too, you know? So um, at a low dose, it, it if, if for your listeners here who probably have never had it, it, I think a low dose feels sort of like if you've ever taken like a, like a clonopin. It's kind of just very light and you feel a like little anti anxiety. Yeah. You just feel very relaxed and you feel floaty, right? If you've ever had nitrous at the dentist, it feels a little bit like that, just very kind of floaty. Uh, but then it goes up from there. So, you know, if you want a sort of a moderate dose, you can have these out of body experiences. Um, and then at higher doses, people actually have near death experiences. Oh, so boy. they actually, it, people who've had both a near-death experience in their life and a very, very high dose of ketamine. And I wouldn't say that we frequently use very high doses. I think we're, again, very conservative. But, you know, some people really want that experience and it's what they need. And they're, you know, they're, they're psychonauts. They're, they just want to explore their mind. Um, I've had one high-dose experience. And as they also say in psychedelics, once you get the message, you hang up the phone and I'm good. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I got it. I know what it feels like to have ego death. And I'm so, so, so happy I had that experience. And now I all of my work um, is in the low dose range. And that's me personally. There's some people who really want to have one high dose experience in the therapeutic setting once every six months. And that's their journey. Mm -hmm. So we, all, we are very different. Yes. But it is possible to be one and done. Yeah, for a lot of people, yeah, one and done. You know? This and, like makes me nervous, and, and especially I, people talk about ayahuasca. It's that's it's a heavy it's a heavy journey for some people. Super intense. Ketamine is not quite as heavy, and uh, yeah, the risk for having bad trips is I think far, 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 far less. Can you go into you know field trip and? with a session with you with just the intention of going, okay, I know I have this subconscious programming that I'm not good enough, which is kind of universal at this yeah. point, or, um, I am not loved or I'm not lovable, whatever these kind of like, you know, basic belief systems of society that we're all running a certain level of, yeah. can you go in there with that intention and like reprogram your brain to that? Yeah. So after you've had your med clearance with our psychiatrist, and then you have a prep session with your therapist, um, or I'm sorry, the intake session with your therapist. Then you go into one of my favorite sessions, which is the preparation session. So we are literally, if somebody came in and said, I wanna change my programming, we're probably going to really go back in a profound way and do just that. And what I ask people to do, and a lot of the my fellow um, staff members will do this as well, I will assign them to write the story that they would like to tell themselves, uh, like a, an autobi a, a biography of yourself, an autobiography. I can't say that word right now. <laughs> an autobiography, um, but the one that you would like to have in 45 seconds. So then right after your injection, I will read that. So maybe it's Kelly was a girl who learned to love herself at a very early age. And the things that she told herself were kind and loving. And she always valued herself like a mother would care for her young. And everything in her life, she could begin to see that. And if there's anything in her past, she knows how to take care of those feelings. So you, would, so I would be reading something like that to you as you're falling into this very deep trance. So you're sort of, you're telling the subconscious, I would like to go here. Okay. Right? right so map. in our model, our model is a little different. You know, I think there are some clinics there their their I guess their what they do or their their preference is to just give people a bunch of ketamine and see where it goes. <laughs> um, I, I think we're a little bit more directive and I like that because you can really 
sort of micro target what you want to change in that person like what is problematic for them what what's working what can you change what are we targeting is it sort of a, an attachment wound uh, is it the way they are in interpersonal relationships is it the way they uh, the the itty bitty shitty comedian in their brain is so loud and they're always the negative self-talk and the beliefs are so so negative and it's a self-loathing like what are we actually targeting and when we can actually tell the subconscious with that those words this is where i want to go uh, I found in my experience that that's exactly where it will take you. And there is something really, again, the your inner healing intelligence and also the wisdom of the subconscious. If that's where you are telling me you want to go, something in you knows that that's exactly where you need to go. And by the way, I've had experiences where people don't know where they need to go and it takes them to a different place. And, that, and then they realize in our next session when we talk about it and we integrate that that was exactly where they needed to go. They thought it was their marriage, but really it was about the way that they felt towards their father and the things that they were telling themselves. And then it's the, oh, that's why I'm having problems in my marriage. I thought it was my marriage itself, but that was just a byproduct of, you know, we're going, so, we're going all the way back, yeah. all the way back. People do have, it's, it's common in the literature and whether you believe that this is a, an actual memory, it's common for people to say they re-experienced the birthing process of coming out of the womb like that, that, we see a lot of case reports where people report that. So it will take you all the way back if that's yeah. where you want to go. Right. No, exactly. Like I am not claustrophobic in an elevator or anything like that. But if I feel I'm in a room without fresh air and it feels stagnant and hot and yeah. I feel like I can't take a breath, you know, that's my claustrophobia that I have. And I have no idea where it comes from. But it's like I can't, you know, like my pillow has to be a certain way. I feel like I'm going to suffocate. Yeah. So. My partner, so he had two profound aha moments. The first was the spiritual experience and finding his light. The second, he also gets a little claustrophobic. And there was this moment in his ketamine journey that he said it felt like uh, the walls were closing in. And he knew that he had to, and this is what we tell people to prepare them, if something is coming towards you, move towards it. Oh, right? gosh. So he knew that he had to sort of move towards the, the shrinking room, the, the walls coming in. And then he was free. And after that one session, I would say 80% of his claustrophobia was gone. Isn't that profound? Yes. That there was something, it wasn't talking about it. It was, it was the experience and I did it and I conquered it yeah. in that moment, in my subconscious, in this sort of deep theta delta visualization, it came to me and I was more powerful. So it, it's just so cool. So cool. What about just a couple other things? Because I'm thinking of all these people in my life that are like, what should I do? Where yeah, do I go? Yeah. Who do I see? Um, one friend has done everything. Hypnotherapy, every diet under the sun. She's one of my most beautiful friends, but she's constantly focused on and struggling with her weight mm -hmm. um, since childhood. And her family is not reflective of her body type. And mm -hmm. she's just so pissed. <laughs> like mm -hmm, she's just mm -hmm. like, I can't figure it out. Like she'll eat lettuce for a month mm -hmm. um, and not change. So I, you know what I mean? Just like, that's just a silly yeah, example, but right she's struggling. She's like, I've been to so many therapists. I've been to hypnotherapists. Everybody thinks that I was molested as a child. And this is a protection resident. She's like, I was not molested as a child. So, you know, would this be something that you've seen help with weight loss or? I have found that uh, a lot of people self-medicate with things like food, but it has to go even deeper. And you know, my instinct with your friend is that could ketamine assisted therapy help to change the way she feels about herself? And maybe it's more self-love, maybe it's going back to um, a, a relationship to food or her body. And maybe that will actually in a very deep way. I mean, listen, we all know what to do on the surface, but I think what ketamine does is it goes down to the very, very root and it helps people to say, okay, if there's something that I need to change, I'm going to change it. Or if the change that I need to do is loving my body as it is, if I'm as healthy as I can be, it doesn't matter what the number on the scale is. I mean, there are other numbers that do matter. You know, your A1C and, you know, we want everything to be, you know, your fasting insulin and glucose. We, we want those to be good. Uh, but is there something that it can actually go to the very surface, to, I'm sorry, to the very depth um, beneath the surface and really change that and to say, this is why I eat, right? Mm. This is why I don't love myself. This is why I'm struggling. And to feel connected and to realize 
For example, if it's a, a moderate dose and you have ego death and you realize that this body is just a garage anyways, does that change the way you feel about yourself and you want to maybe take care of the garage, but you don't fixate on it? So is it almost paradoxical that the way that ketamine assisted therapy could possibly work for your friend? Um, or for some people, and it is um, an anti-medication medication. So, you know, while we do screen for drug seeking, there is indeed a lot of research, probably the research is a little stronger for psilocybin than ketamine, but there is published research of people who've used ketamine to help people not abuse drugs and alcohol. Mm. So isn't it so interesting that the, these are anti-medication medications? You know, whether it's you want to taper off an SSRI, go on a lower dose, move from three psychotropic medications to one with the help of ketamine. Maybe you're planning to become pregnant. You don't want to be on three medications. And, you know, you go through a program and then get pregnant. And a lot of times the effects will last through a whole pregnancy um, because it is a long lasting treatment. Um, it, it's just profound what it can do for people. And, you know, again, going to the root of roots that hypnosis, hypnosis can help some people if there's some awareness, but I think ketamine can go even deeper. Uh, and if you're not hypnotizable or, you know, there are a subset of people who are not, um, ketamine can, can help you to go there. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I have, again, I have that reaction and judgment of ketamine. Cause mm. I, you know, like ayahuasca, weed, psilocybin, you know, mushrooms or whatever, um, to me, I just think that that's from the earth. Like, God, it's not altered. Yeah. You know, of course, ayahuasca is the blend of, of two plants. But um, so, you know, the medication, the anti-medication medication is a, is a way to stay open, you know, because yeah. my whole thing is like, I, you know, I don't want to become too attached to my beliefs or judgments. Yeah, so. but it's so interesting what you just said, because I think we all do that, right? And we put things in categories of good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. So I think most people listen to this podcast, it's SSRIs are bad, um, ayahuasca, good, ketamine, I have a memory of that, so that's bad. Exercise is good, but even when we look at things like exercise, you know, I, I have patients who, you know, exercise in the context of an eating disorder, their exercise is bad. Mm -hmm. They're exercising eight hours a day. So I think it's more about the turning off the polarized black or white thinking and to say, wow, what a beautiful, wonderful toolbox we now have because mental illness is notoriously hard to treat because, because of course we're treating the most complex organs. So doesn't it make sense that it's hard to treat? But then when we look at, you know, in terms of hope, when we look at the, you know, approximately two thirds of patients who are not helped by prescription antidepressants, you know, they're not, they're not meeting criteria for um, no longer meeting diagnostic criteria. So there's, there's, it's still there, you know. So for those people can putting together the right cocktail of, of these, these modalities and, and to find the right one, you know, I think mm -hmm. we should all stay open. I, I, I tend to believe a lot more in, in foods and fasting and supplements than I do prescription medications. That being said, I know that I have to look in myself and stay open because there may be a time when that may be the thing for me, you know? So I think for all of us, we, I think we, we categorize and there is this sort of um, as our, our friend Dr. Felicia says, this medical tribalism, right? Where it's it's almost like it's mirroring politics with COVID. It's mm -hmm. like it's like far right or far left, and you know I I'm definitely left of center, but <laughs> I, I think sometimes we just also need to be aware of our awareness too. Yeah, totally. It's interesting. Yeah, and I think that this is so important. It's so good to check your own reactions and triggers and judgments because yeah. like. For instance, one of my favorite books I've read in the last year and a half is this book, Untamed, by Glennon Doyle. Mm. So I started following Glennon Doyle, and I was just like, oh my gosh, her writing style, her personal story and vulnerability is fucking badass. Mm. Excuse my French. Is, <laughs> is badass. Um, you know, and she now has a podcast, and she even talks about it in her book. And the, when I got to the page in her book where she says, I love my antidepressant. Mm. I need my mm. antidepressant to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this immediate reaction of like, oh, she's not my people or mm -hmm. oh, this judgment. And I had, because I was so in love with her writing and felt so resonant to her, mm -hmm. it uh, allowed me the opportunity to, to not judge in that moment and go, oh, I'm curious. Mm. I want to know more. Yeah. What, you know, perhaps, perhaps there is a time for everything and a need for everything in this toolbox, you yeah. know, and just to be aware. And 
Um, you know, she talks about how she literally gets relief when she sees a pharmacy. Mm. She walks in because she knows that's been her savior of mm-hmm. like, she found balance through that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people that can't, or there's a lot of people mm-hmm. that did temporarily. And then that SSSRI caused a whole host of other issues. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, I think the moral of that story is that that love I developed for her kept me open and not going down the spiral of like, knee-jerk judgment yeah. to her choices and, and what's worked for her and helped save her life and so if we can just remain curious and open yeah um and if you're called to do something don't judge yourself you know just be open to what what is coming up in your awareness because that could be a step for you on your journey it's such a great point right and i love your language it felt very hypnotic you know in hypnosis i use a lot of phrases like oh i i, I wonder i wonder if Right. And a lot of times I'll plant positive suggestions. You know, I wonder if you'll notice more optimism popping up for you. But I think we all need to do just that. Stay more curious and more open and less judgmental because you're right. uh, We don't know. And, you know, I think the other thing that comes to us a lot is cost. You know, it it is certainly the cheapest treatment is taking an antidepressant. It's cheaper than therapy. It's cheaper than ketamine assisted therapy. It's cheaper than hypnosis. And if somebody is working two jobs and they have three kids and they work 80 hours a week and they don't even have an hour, but they have major depressive disorder and they've experienced that and there's a family history of that and they can pay five bucks. You know, I have to actually listen to that person's experience and and say, I understand why you made that choice and that's your choice. And if it's working for you, okay. You know, I I do think that there is a time for most of us to go a little bit more root oriented. You know, I I practice a lot of functional nutrition and I do a lot of genetic testing and, and, you know, it, it, it's so nice when people can have the time and I think eventually we can all get there. Um, and I do hope, um, that, um, our treatment will be covered by more insurances soon. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we saw this with another, um, probably the other really effective treatment for a treatment resistant depression, transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. You know, those insurance now almost always will cover that for major depression. I hope that in five years we're going to see that with our treatment. Um, but, you know, by the way, even right now, our when you break it down per hour, the cost is $300 an hour, roughly, for our whole program. And that's, you know, with this medicine, it's not that high. It's about, you know, in L.A., that's about average for what you're going to pay for therapy without ketamine, right? Mm-hmm. So, um I think access is something, but yes, the openness, it's so important for us all. And I think especially right now in, you know, post COVID and politics, I think there's more judgment and we've divided ourselves in these camps, medical camps, even Mm -hmm. they're so, you know, it's almost like we're warring within the the health community. And I, and I feel like we can probably come together a little bit more in that realm as well. And it sounds like ketamine could be one of the ways to, activate that right brain and that connection that reconnection to each other to yeah. the universe to life yeah you know to some greater spiritual meaning for our lives yeah you know you you talk about this ego death and you know i've often i don't know if you've heard of anita morjani story but we had her in heal mm-hmm. and she had this near-death experience and i was like you know riddled with cancer late stage cancer organs were shutting down lemon-sized tumor coming out of her neck down to her abdomen, physical body as far gone as it could be. She goes into a coma, has a near-death experience, and has this shift in consciousness because she connected to that source energy, Mm -hmm. that oneness from which we come. Um, Had this encounter with her father. She realized that every decision she had made in her life was driven by fear, Mm -hmm. and that if she went back into her body with this new kind of awareness that she would heal. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. And I, you know, I'm so fat. She's like the poster child of heal. Um, And I was like, how do we access that shift in consciousness? Mm. Uh, You know, and it sounds like perhaps ketamine assisted uh, hypnotherapy could, or or therapy could be that access point. Um, You said you had a death of your ego. Yes. I'm wondering does your ego show up now? Is like, how does your ego show up now? Are you completely shifted and you're like Anita (laughs) Morjani? That's a great question. My ego, you know, as I say, the ego speaks first and it speaks loudest. I would say my ego is softer. 
and I'm also more aware and I've had the experience of not having that, you know, it, it's very Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, you know, when you have the experience of that part of you going offline, it's something that always stays with you, even when your ego comes back online, like hers did and like mine did. But it certainly speaks much more quietly. I think I am more kind to myself. I think some of my type A personality um, and just revving my um, fight or flight system to get things done when I took too much on that I'm more aware of and I say no more and I work with people like you who I love working with. And I think the intersection between, and I actually needed, because you know I'm one of those people, I just love data. I had to see some labs and some um, you know, some data for my aura ring to know, oh no, you really are taking on too much. Like you really shouldn't, one year I decided to write two books at the same time because I got a, a second offer after I already made an offer with one publisher, another publisher came to me and I, I saw how stressed I got in my labs, in my heart rate variability, all these measures. And it's interesting now that I work with a lot of patients with autoimmune diseases and what do we know is sort of the one thing that's most in your control, stress. Right? What, what is the great activator to all these conditions? It's stress. So for me, I think the takeaway is having ego death allowed me to have this really profound reframe where I'm less stressed. I, you know, and in, in some of the research with people with stage four cancer who go through psilocybin assisted psychotherapy, it's realizing that, oh, I, I understand that there is something else and that makes me less afraid of death and that leads to less stress. And could that actually lead to less disease and less conditions going into flares and things like that? I think so. Um, I think I'm sleeping better. Um, my heart rate variability is up. It used to be very, very low, which was an indication that I was always perennially in, in fight or flight because I was just, you know, type A and I need to do this and that show and this book and keep a full private practice. And it's, you know, and, and my two dogs and my partner, it's like, it, it, was, it was too much. And, and so that I think was the best. And yes, I do think for most people, if you, if you read Anita's work and you say, I want that, I, I think if there was a way, if there was a drug and a, and a process to, to have a similar experience, I certainly think that ketamine assisted psychotherapy for a lot of people is that, is that thing. Yeah. Um, so fascinating. So where <laughs> can people um, find you? So my website and all social media, I'm at Dr. Mike Dow. Um, and then I'm also on staff at Field Trip Health, which is fieldtriphealth.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for thank sharing you so your much, experience Kelly. and what you're doing to help so many people. And I love hanging with you. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.